that. Absolutely. Uh, we'll just, you know, we'll go to, we got plenty of room around here. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Professor Sheila Buffer. She's a uh, university distinguished professor over at Florida Kim. And she's been, uh, please love, give an update up on your, on your, on your journey and what you're working on. I can't even sum it up. Thank you very much. First of all, good evening, everyone here in the room. Uh, it's nice to see the people in the room. I've been tuning in every week from uh, the remote location. And uh, thank you very much, Jacob, for initiating and organizing and seeing this series through. I've been enjoying it all, and I hope uh, you have been as well. One thing that I have not been enjoying is this. I've been looking at this of uh, viewing, uh, tuning in remotely every week, and I thought, oh, I just, uh, I just am tired of looking at this trash barrel. However, tonight it's a prop, right? So you never know when the tables will be turned or the trash barrels will be turned. And um, Sue Higgins, who will follow me, uh, will be talking more about such things. There are much more attractive ones outside the classroom, as you know. So now I realize that everybody's going to be focusing on that trash barrel rather than on my talk, right? Okay, well, I, I, no, 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 it's there. It's a prop now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> In any case, what I uh, have been doing over the past few years is looking at sustainability from a research perspective. Uh, and one of the things that I have found really fascinating is the wealth of information that is available on behavioral change and application of psychological measures and uh, techniques to um, getting humans to become more sustainable and engage in more practices such as recycling, reusing, and reducing uh, consumption. So that's what I'm going to focus on in the next few minutes. And then we will hear from Sue Higgins to learn about how things happen in the real world uh, here on the Northeastern campus. Well, this isn't uh, anything new to you folks. You're here, we're talking to the converted, you folks are um, well aware of the importance of sustainability. And so we know that resource efficiency and waste management policies all basically involve reducing, reusing, and recycling. We know there's a huge increase in demand for a lot of materials. What might be some of the materials out there in the world that we are having an insatiable demand for? What are some of the materials? Yes. Masks, got it. Yeah, everybody but everybody here has a mask on. I hope you folks at home have your mask on. Uh, um, all right, Jacob gave me a pass on that today, uh, but I did I do have it. All right, what are some other materials that are in demand? Yes. Lithium and cobalt for, for batteries, absolutely. Okay, what else? High demand. How about chips, silicon chips, right? A lot of uh, a lot of supply chain issues are <coughs> resulting from the fact that we're so dependent upon computer chips. And I have one of my colleagues here said it has taken her six months to get an, an appointment at a at a repair place for her car for that reason. Yes. Um, it's a it's a little unique, but holiday presents. Many large corporations are imploring their customers to order them now because of how long it will take to actually get them to the power of the supply chain. So when looking at things that are in demand or will soon be in high demand, all the things that people think they can get at Christmas Eve, that if you order Christmas Eve, we'll get you right around Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, so there are some uh, seasonal and cyclical shortages. Thank you, Rylan. All right, and then uh, another thing that is in short supply is sand. I've been conducting research on the global sand crisis, and the and I've also determined through a survey of about uh, 400 people in Canada and the U.S. in the building and construction industry that uh, there is very very limited awareness, if any, 
of the global sand crisis and the need for, uh, for substitution of sustainable materials for sand. Sand is so important in concrete, right, in building, and many, many other materials uh, that are used in the construction industry. And a lot of that sand, the best sand for those materials happens to come from rivers, coastlines, and we know the problems that arise when you remove sand from, uh, from uh, those locales. Uh, more problems than you might even be aware of, actually. All right, so demand for materials is increasing uh, in, uh, in many facets of our lives. Now, understanding human decision-making can provide insights on how to design more effective policies on sustainable consumption and production. So, uh, we are all human, and we have a lot of habits that we engage in that may be just routine, that's what habits are. We, we may kind of put ourselves on automatic pilot in terms of the way we do things. Uh, and we may not be aware of a lot of the biases that we have, some unconscious biases. And so psychologists can try to get at those biases and the habits that we engage in and try to get us out of our comfort zones. What are some of the best ways to employ these behavioral, that this knowledge that comes from the social sciences, lots of experiments have been done. Uh, how can these best be, be channeled uh, towards in, uh, getting all of us to become more sustainable in our activities? That's the focus of the talk. So human decision-making. Well, um, we need to take a look at these things that are in the illustrations. First of all, people have many choices in consumption and often engage in habitual behaviors. Secondly, there are a lot of consequences of consumption that are hard to see. Um, do you think about the life cycle of products, for instance? Um, you, sure, electric cars sound great, right? They don't use fossil fuels, but what about those batteries? And um, in terms of their sustainability, right? And disposing of those batteries once they are no longer useful. So um, these consequences can often be hard to see. So there's a matter of education that is, in, that is required uh, as one of the components to behavioral change, right? Okay. Um, the next one says sustainable consumption uh, may not seem personally relevant. Yeah, okay. If you don't even own a car, who cares about whether it's sustainable or not? Okay, now the, bo the bottom two illustrations, well, one says behavior is influenced by your peers and social groups, okay? And we're going to spend some time on that, an actual special focus on that in this presentation. And lastly, it can be hard to follow through on sustainable choices. Why? What might be some reasons why you wanna be sustainable? You want to do the right thing. What might be some barriers to that? Yes. Um, financial, barriers. financial barriers. Yes, please elaborate. It's uh, Chris Mary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, sometimes like they're the most sustainable choice can cause maybe like, be a little bit more expensive or like take a little bit more time. And you know, like not everybody has like that time to like put into these efforts. Exactly. Time and money are very precious resources. And they are limited resources. Okay. What else besides time and money? might prevent you from being more sustainable. Yes. Absolutely, and that is one of the goals of our climate justice action plan here at the university, right? Exploring those inequities in society, right? Okay, and trying to provide access to important resources that are not currently available in certain communities. All right, <laughs> so we need to close the gap between our intentions to be sustainable and the actions we actually take to become, uh, to follow through, okay? 
So there was a study conducted last year uh, called the Great Green Sustainability Study. And they found that 80% of those surveyed say, yes, they want to do more to help the environment. Um, but um, they said that 70, but 75% similarly said they actually could do more. They could do more if they thought about it more, if they had more resources, et cetera, right? All right, so let's look at that intention action gap, how to change behavior to help the environment. So we've got old habits. We want to see those go into the rear view mirror and engage in new habits. So um, I'm just going to move along here and so that we can spend more time on some of the actual research about how to change people's habits. Anyone heard of nudge theory? Nudge theory. It sounds kind of cool, don't you think? It's got, it's got a, 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 the cool part of it is, it doesn't sound like it, it, you're getting hit with a, uh, with a, brick, uh, with a, a brick on your head, right? Nudge. Just just kind of gently move you in a direction, right? Yeah. So nudge theory, I think it's a, a wonderful name for it. And uh, it is, a, um, these are choices or actions that apply insights from behavioral science to, to improve existing choices, not just consumers, but um, uh, various types of stakeholders. So here are three characteristics of nudges. Okay? First of all, uh, they avoid being focused on money, being avoid being focused on financial incentives to get you to do things, right? Um, or to punish you by fining you for uh, not separating your recyclables, for instance, right? So it's not that. Um, second thing is nudges are human-centered. So they attempt to move people in directions to make their lives better, okay? human-centered, not some amorphous system out there. Third, and this is, I think, the most important thing, nudges are voluntary, just by the nature of that word, okay? So if you nudge people along, you give them suggestions, and you kind of make it in their best interest to, to follow your suggestion, right? while at the same time giving people the, the freedom of choice. Okay. Um, but what's in people's best interests may certainly varies from person to person. Okay, social pressure. Remember I said that at the outset, that we're going to take a look at that in a little more detail. Well, social pressure wins the day. That's the way I like to say it, in that it is one of the most forceful ways of channeling your attitudes, your intentions, and your behaviors, right? Because, uh, <clears throat> hey, what's the, the thing about it is, as opposed to an, uh, financial incentives or punishments to do something, right? Uh, this is not going, getting at your cognitive psyche. It's getting at your emotional, uh, your uh, emotional side of your brain, right? Your affective side, because you want everybody wants to be accepted. Nobody wants to live alone in isolation, right? So you want to engage in community. We all know that from the isolation that that we were forced into over the past um, eighteen months, right? So look at this magic that happens when you have social pressure as a nudge. So there was a study done in the hotel industry a few years ago. Half the group um, in, in the hotels, um, half the rooms had the, the very familiar little hang tie, right? Please reuse the towels. And then there is a list of reasons why it's important to save the environment. And I think there's some data in there, for instance, uh, let me see. Yes, the environment deserves our respect. 
You can show your respect for nature and help save the environment by reusing your towels during your stay. Who's seen that in, in a hotel room? Right? Yeah, pretty common. Well, turns out that rather than that being the effective way of nudging people to reuse their towels, it was found that when they were to, when uh, the other group was told, hey, 80% of the people in this hotel recycle their towels and, uh, uh, or, you know, use them for multiple uh, days during their stay. That was more effective at getting people to reuse their towels. Social pressure. You feel like you're doing things that um, are accepted by uh, members of a group that you affiliate with. A second one, having to do with recycling, and this is more uh, relevant to what Sue is going to be talking about, is that, again, social pressure comes in to neighborhoods where when you put your recyclables out on the street, everybody can see whether you've done a good job or not at that, right? How conscientious you are. That, that was more effective at getting people to recycle responsibly than having them go and take them to an anonymous recycling center. So again, social pressure, right? I think I better stop because we, we need to have time for Sue. I will just quickly go over a couple of things here. This is a, a, a behavioral change grid. It's a system that was uh, designed by a uh, professor who teaches at Stanford. And uh, his name is Dr. Fogg. And he's created a grid. And just quickly, I'll say that down the, um, you can see that one is time, uh, time specific. Either do you want to change a behavior just once? Do you want to change it over a period of time, a span of time? Or do you want to change it for good from now on? And so basically he says it's the purple path. And that is you provide um, various incentives to get people to change their behavior for good. And um, one of the things that I'll just mention is there are two very important aspects to this. To enable people to actually uh, change their behavior. On the x-axis, ability. Make things easy for people, right? Who wants to read a long list of instructions about how to do things? Uh, make it really simple and easy, accessible, and then make sure that you can find ways to motivate people to engage in those behaviors, okay? And there's ability, there's motivation, and that is it because we have the motivation and the ability to welcome Sue Higgins to come and perhaps apply this to the Northeastern campus recycling um, activities. And I also want to thank uh, Unshin Peng for her assistance in preparing uh, this slideshow presentation. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions later on. There we go. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you all. Um, Sheila, that was wonderful. Um, I have to say, I here at Northeastern, I'm the Associate Director of Materials and Recycling. I work in facilities. I basically manage our waste, our recycling, our food waste composting here on campus. Um, outside of my job here, um, I've done this for many years. I'm an engineer by training. I went the environmental route from uh, right from the start. I have a bachelor's of science and engineering physics and a master's in civil and hazardous materials management. So for my career, I've really worked in um, you know, managing waste, both um, solid waste and hazardous waste. 
Um, outside of that, I, in my community where I live, I chair the Waste Reduction Committee. And so much of what you just said applies not only to uh, the university and how we might pursue changes here, but just everywhere on a municipal level, how to motivate people and really make change happen. And in the big picture, you know, we need to make these changes everywhere. We need to make the behavioral changes that will take place here and that will go into other aspects of our life too. So that was just wonderful, thank you. Um, today, what I wanna talk about is sustainable waste management. And sometimes I also call it zero waste or approaching zero waste. Um, those terms are tricky because getting to zero waste is almost impossible. There's always gonna be something left over that needs to be disposed of or managed in some special way. But we can certainly do much better than we are doing today. Uh, but as we work to get there, there's a lot of elements that we need to consider. Some of them are obvious um, and some maybe are not quite so obvious. So here at Northeastern, the logistics and the demographics of our campus is a very important element. Um, we are an urban environment. We have approximately 70 acres of campus space here and more than 100 buildings. And those buildings are all unique. We have residential dorms. We have academic buildings, administrative buildings, labs, which have very unique waste management uh, needs and requirements. We have retail, dining, uh, athletics, event space, outdoor space. And you know, all of these components together have to be factored into making a system that works campus-wide to help us meet our goals. Uh, waste is very uh, regulatory driven. We operate under a lot of rules and requirements, both on a federal, state, and local level. What we do is influenced by the market. I mean, everybody heard about, you know, years ago with the China incident when they stopped taking our contaminated recycling, we're left with all these materials, no place for it to go. Um, so what we can do depends on what's happening out there. Um, it depends on what the industry is able to do. And an example at the present time is black plastic. So you get takeout food, it comes in a black plastic container. That is not recyclable. And it's not recyclable only because the industry cannot capture it. Um, plastics are sorted at recycling facilities optically and the optical reader just cannot detect that black plastic on the black conveyor belt. So it goes to the trash. So we're limited you know, and what we can do uh, based on how the industry is limited. Uh, we need data and metrics, we need resources. And, you know, I, I love the presentations at the beginning. I, and as I said, I would just love to be able to do something with our cooking oil, create our own biodiesel, have our own recycling facility, uh, but space of all the resources, space is the most precious one to us. There is no place to put anything <laughs> and that's a challenge. Um, the behavior and commitment that uh, Sheila talked about is, is very important. Uh, we need everybody buying into the system if we really want to get to zero waste or approaching zero waste. And as you've heard as a theme throughout these series of presentation, resilience is very important. And when COVID hit and our world was turned upside down here on campus and everywhere, it was resilience in our contracts and in our practices and approaches that let us continue through that. And you'll see that in some of the data that we'll look at. So who manages the recycling here? Um, Waste and Recycling Division is a part of facility services. In addition to a small uh, management staff of which I am one of a few, there's a crew of seven. They are essential personnel here on campus, so, which means they provide daily coverage, seven days a week, um, holidays, weekends, breaks, snowstorms. They're here all the time uh, working hard to remove the waste and the recycling. They also handle a lot of specialty collections, so not just our day-to-day -day trash and uh, typical recycling, electronics, uh, light bulbs, batteries. And there are periods of the year that they are uh, very inundated with work. And that's pretty much move in and move out when um, the workload is very heavy. The photo here is in the Baracus loading dock. And it's probably, you know, 25 hampers of cardboard in there, which are 20 bushel hampers. That's one day's worth of cardboard that was collected in September of 2019, just from the dorms after move-in. And we do that day after day after day. 
Uh, we are supported by outside contractors um, who help us. Uh, some, you know, we have one that does all our trash and recycling and then many specialty uh, contractors who help us handle unique items. And this crew of seven has to work collaboratively with many other facilities staff across campus. The transportation department helps move large, heavy items. The grounds crew handles the outdoor barrels. The building superintendents and the cleaning crew get everything from in the building down to the loading docks where we pick it up. So it's a lot of work and, and it's a collaborative effort. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure that we use to collect, store, move items um, on a daily basis. We have a waste and uh, recycling collection route that goes through the campus. Our hauler comes with a packer truck, which is a standard truck that you see you know, at home going through your neighborhoods picking up trash. And the crew uses box trucks for supplemental collection after that route is done. That uh, picture on the top left are compactors. We have 22 of those here on campus. They range in size from 17 cubic yards to 45 cubic yards. We use those to hold materials for longer periods of time so we can more effectively move them to the recycling markets or disposal. The, our biggest one is our paper compactor, which is behind the Snell Library. That's a 45 cubic yard capacity. And when full, it holds about 15 tons of paper. So it holds a lot. The two in the picture there are behind Stetson. Uh, the one on the left is for trash and the one on the right is for cardboard. Uh, we also have numerous open top containers that are much smaller. They may be two yards, four yards. Um, the two in the picture, which is on the top right, are in right or parking lot. They're eight and 10 yards. Those are for primarily trash, but we have a couple for cardboard. Those are for locations where we need more storage capacity than a trash barrel or a couple of totes, uh, but we can't put a compactor there. And those are serviced daily, they're empty daily. Uh, inside the buildings, um, the bottom left is an example trash and recycling room in one of the dorms. We use toters, hampers, um, different kinds of containers combined with signage to make sure that we're able to handle all the materials. And uh, somebody at the beginning referred to our three bin system. That is a new initiative that we started about, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before, to have uh, consistent containers campus-wide that provide for all recycling, always together with trash. Um, there are a few locations you'll see, like in Curry Student Center in the active eating area. We have only the bottles and cans in the trash because all the paper that comes out of there would be contaminated paper that really needs to be disposed. So there's a few isolated places where we've made some edits to how we package them. Uh, and then outdoors, we have solar powered um, waste and recycling containers. They, they have the solar panels on the top. It compresses the materials so that they don't have to be collected quite as often. And those are managed by the grounds crew. Um, so if we take a look at some data, um, this is 2019 data and 2020 data. Um, 2019, I would say, is probably most typical of our operations over a longer period of time. Uh, we generate here on campus, and this is just operational waste, so it's not construction and demolition waste from major projects or building renovations that take place. So more than 5,500 tons per year of waste generated on campus, which was 2019. Uh, we do a good job moving much of it to composting and recycling, and we'll look more specifically at that data. But, you know, that the bar showing the amount disposed is very high, and that's what we need to work on. We need to work on getting that down. And it's not just moving it from disposal to recycling and composting. It's reducing what we generate in the first place. We can't recycle ourselves out of our waste problems. We need to reduce what we're generating. If you look at 2020, you know, on first thought, you'd think, oh, we did just that. Look how low we got those numbers. But 2020 was COVID. And that's why those numbers are so small. Uh, it was March, I guess. It was March. And we weren't into, we knew, you know, everyone was monitoring what was happening with COVID. We did not anticipate having students move off campus. We thought everyone would kind of, you know, do classes from their dorm rooms. And then in a matter of a day, it changed and everybody was moving out with no notice. It was chaos. Um, parents were picking up their students. They weren't able to get a U-Haul or a van. They were 
putting whatever they could in their cars and just leaving items on the sidewalks. It was, it was definitely chaos. Um, but if we look at the data on a percentage basis um, in, the, in the pie charts, you'll see that despite that, we were able to still divert the same amount of waste from disposal in 2020 as we did in 2019. Both years, we were at about a 41% diversion rate. Uh, then the, it shifted a little in terms of how much went to composting, how much went to recycling, um, but 41% is, is pretty good. Um, it's not as good as we can be or want to be, but, but it's not bad. And I mentioned at the beginning resilience, and that is it's the resiliency of our contracts that let us achieve that. We have uh, very strong contracts uh, for waste management and recycling that really give us full control. So when situations change, we are able to uh, require our vendors to send more recycling trucks and more trash trucks to be here more often. We're able to shut services down when nobody is here um, and make the changes necessary to ensure we can focus on the operations that really matter. And we did a lot of that during COVID and during the period when you know, that recycling crew was still here every day with a very small population of people keeping an eye on things. So this gives you a little bit more info on what we're exactly recycling. If we look at just what is in that um, amount of material that we're diverting to recycling. The biggest bar at the top is single stream recycling. Many of you probably know what that means, but if you don't, single stream is when everything's mixed in together. So the fiber, the paper, and the cardboard the plastic, glass, metal, it all gets thrown in into one container uh, and it goes to the recycling <coughs> facility, they sort everything out. It's pretty common practice in most places. We're moving away from single stream as much as we can and going with multi-stream. So that's you know our three bin system with the uh, paper separate from bottles and cans, it keeps the material cleaner, it re you know, reduces contamination, makes them more valuable moving them to a recycling market. So I think, you know, if, if we do this again next year, we look at 2021 numbers, we'll see that single stream bar come down. We still do that sometimes of the year, move in and move out when it's extremely heavy uh, volumes, that we will single stream all the materials into the packer truck that's coming around campus. Still all recycling, we never mix trash and recycling, uh, but it's just too much volume for us to be <coughs> focusing on keeping them separate. Um, you can see there's uh, quite a bit of grease that we generate, and this is reported on a um, tonnage basis. I'd have to go back and look at what that means in terms of gallons. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to have that biodiesel facility here for ourselves. Um, and then you see cardboard, paper, bottles, and cans. Those are the traditional recyclables. We, bottles and cans are really containers. So it's the plastic, metal, glass, bottle jar, jugs, tubs. Um, and I want to look a little more closely at cardboard and paper. Those are the fiber streams. If you combine them, you'll see it's a, quite a lengthy bar. And if you consider this, what's in single stream, the cardboard and paper are probably 80% of what's in our single stream materials. So it's a large amount of what we produce. Um, and this is a graph that shows the value of those materials. It, dates back to January of 2020, and it goes out to last month. And these are um, the official board market or OBM yellow sheet pricing specific to the Northeast area. Uh, and that pricing is what a mill, what a paper mill has reported it will pay for material being delivered to its mill that's not under contract. So it's like an open market, spot market pricing. And it's really reflective of what's happening out there. So paper is the blue dashed line at the bottom, and you can see in early 2020, it was a negative value. The recycling facilities had to pay the mills to take their paper. And, you know, it's changed a lot since then. It's kind of increased slowly. It was pretty stable. And finally, last month, it hit about $90 per ton in terms of the value of paper. Uh, cardboard has always had a little higher value. It's a, um, a much more... Um, longer fibers, more recyclable, can you know, be reused more often. That started, I guess, at about $25 a ton, and last month was at $175 per ton in value. Um, one of the things to point out with that is there's a little shaded area in the middle, and that represents the cost for the recycling facility to process the materials. 
So even though something is worth a hundred bucks a ton, if it costs a recycling facility $90 a ton to process it, there's really only a $10 value on that for profit. And so that is reflected in, you know, what do we pay for services? And there's kind of, you know, decisions that need to be made in terms of whether we as a university want to take risk of fluctuating markets or whether we want to just have stable pricing and put it back on the hauler. We do take the risk for paper and cardboard. And so we are, um, you know, realizing some benefits. Um, the cost of our program is still much more expensive than what we earn back, but it's a nice little rebate back to us. So you just have to keep in mind, you know, for the pricing, um, when the prices plummet, it impacts the ability to move that material to market. So in the beginning, when I said, you know, the market influences, this this could be one of them. Oh, uh, what's the cost for a weight for, for Um It's complicated. <laughs> um, we have our contract for waste here has multi uh, pricing <laughs> elements in it in you know, it takes me a full day every time I get the invoice for a month to process it because it's a 100-page invoice. Um, we get a waste slip associated for every load that gets delivered, including the daily morning uh, truck routes uh, for both trash and recycling. We require they come with an empty truck. They collect our materials, and then they weigh it before they pick anyone else up. So we get exact data to allow us to further develop our programs. So there's like a pricing associated with the daily collection routes, and then um, the compactors. We looked at a picture of the compactors. Um, I guess transportation, It's we pay $125 per trip. So every time they pick a compactor, bring it to a facility to empty it and bring it back to us, we pay $125. And then depending on whether it's recycling or what's in it, we either we pay for the processing cost, and then if it's the cardboard or paper, and the values are high, we can earn a rebate. So, there's a lot of different kind of price points in there, but it is, it's expensive. Yeah, waste management is not cheap. So these are just, you know, we have a lot of challenges with recycling and the, the two biggest challenges are the materials not being prepared properly and uh, the wrong things being put in the bin. So the first photo is containers <clears throat> that aren't rinsed out. Um, this is Maureen Tumman isn't here, which is good because she would be looking to see who did that. Uh, but this is a, a vendor on campus who's not here anymore. I don't know if any of you remember Chicken Loose that used to be on Forsyth Street, but that came out of Chicken Loose. Um, and the rule of thumb is if you can look at the container and tell what was in it without seeing a label, like you know that's mayonnaise and salsa and you know salad dressing, it's too dirty. It does not have to be spotlessly cleaned, but it does need to be rinsed with no residual food or liquid. Um, also, I mentioned space is at a premium everywhere. So the middle photo shows, you know, people who don't want to break down their boxes and flatten them. And that's kind of a dramatic example. Uh, but, you know, that hamper should hold many, many cardboard boxes all flattened. And instead, we got maybe five or six in there. Uh, and then there's just not space for other people to recycle. And so it's a behavioral thing. If you go down, it's not easy, right? You go down to recycle, you want to recycle your cardboard box, but there's no place to put it, so it goes in the trash, whatever is easier. Um, and then um, packaging inside boxes is a, is a huge problem for us. People leave the styrofoam, the plastic. When something like that shows up at the recycling facility, the entire thing is trashed. Um, they do not have the resources or the staff or the ability to pull styrofoam out of boxes and recover that cardboard box so it all goes to trash. Um, to combat some of these changes or these problems, we've um, started to do some focused outreach and education. Uh, we had a work study student who created various flyers for us, which were posted in the dorm recycling rooms. Um, these are just two examples in. One of them focuses on something that should not be recycled that we see recycled a lot. And here it's cartons, um, milk cartons, soy milk, uh, jute, the, anything gable top, the aseptic packaging that's shelf stable. And the reason is they're multi layers of materials. It's fiber, it's people think it's wax, but it's actually plastic kind of sprayed on and aluminum. There's only a couple of mills in the United States that can actually process that material and recover the fiber. None of them are near us. None of our recycling facilities around here um, will accept these in recycling. So this highlights a problem that that's, this is unique to us. 
if a student comes here from California or from Michigan or someplace that is doing it, they may say, but I recycle that at home all the time. So the rules are different in different places. And that is challenging with recycling, especially at a university where people come from all over the country and all over the world. Second problem with recycling is the rules change all the time. So pizza boxes is a perfect example. For years and years, the rule was don't put your pizza box in recycling. It's too dirty. It's going <coughs> to contaminate the recycling. Don't put it in. So then a short while ago, the industry did a study and they found that, well, as long as it's empty, the, the box is such good fiber that we want it anyways. The grease that's in the bottom is not a problem. So the new rule is the pizza boxes are recyclable. It just has to be completely empty. No pizza savers, those little plastic shelves, no liners, no napkins, no chicken wing <clears throat> bones or crusts, completely empty. Uh, and a lot of people suggest that one way to um, facilitate recycling that is actually turn the box inside out so that it's obvious to everyone that there's nothing left inside it. But we're trying to educate and um, inform people about the rules that apply here. And by here, I mean, you know, the University of Boston and generally the state of Massachusetts. This is just another recycling guide. This follows a template that the state has created. We have these in the dorm rooms um, just to provide a kind of pictorial, simple, straightforward information about what is actually recyclable and what the basic problem areas are. Um, Okay, so composting, uh, that's another big element of our program here. And it's one that many, many people are interested in. So right now we are composting only at the dining halls and the eateries on campus. We have 10 locations uh, where been similar to what you see in the picture. This is actually at Curry Student Center in the loading dock area next to Curry and L Hall. Um, we're only doing the dining halls right now because anywhere else it's too contaminated. And so somebody brought up BU, and I'm, I'm very interested to track what they're doing because BU has taken this bold leap of putting uh, compost containers in all their dorms on every floor. And um, it was a huge move very quickly, and I'm, I'm very interested to see how it works. The preliminary feedback I'm getting is it's loaded with contamination. So, you know, sometimes it's better to go slower and smaller steps. Um, so we've handled the kitchen prep waste, uh, spoiled food, uh, food past its, you know, eat by date or whatever that might be. Um, we can take limited amounts of, um, I guess, what, what I would call um, non-food non BPI certified products. So in the dining halls, you'll see some of those materials. Um, if any of you eat in the dining halls, there's an ice cream station with soft serve ice cream. That plastic cup that you put it in is actually BPI certified plastic. The spoon that goes with it is BPI certified. Those can be composted. Um, but because our food waste goes to a land-based composting facility, which is the Hidden Acres Farm in Midway, Mass., they put a lot of restrictions on us as to the amount of those materials that can be in with the food waste. So the fear is when we try to move beyond the kitchens and in, into dorms or events or office spaces, we may see too much of that material for our hauler and the composting facility um, to be able to take it. And we'll start having our materials rejected and thrown away, which achieves the exact opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, so right now we are focusing uh, primarily on the uh, dining halls. So we've been doing composting here in collaboration with dining and Maureen Timmons talked about this a little bit for 15 years. Um, you can see low numbers in the early years uh, increase to probably the 500 to 600 tons per year range is the right value. The last couple of years, the numbers are very high. Um, I came here in 2019 um, and we started looking really closely at the data. A lot of it was estimated, and there wasn't a lot of good supporting information for the estimates. Um, you can kind of see it looks like it was steadily increasing, and so we're not really confident that that data is correct. Um, 2020 is very low, again, because of COVID. 
Um, and then in February of 2021, we entered into a new contract with our new hauler, which is Ciro Cooperative. And one of our requirements is strong metrics, strong data collection. So we're hoping that over the course of this year and moving into next year, we're going to get much better data and be much more certain about what we're actually generating and moving to composting. Um, so composting has similar challenges as recycling, which is contamination. The first photo is just, it's a beautiful photo. It almost looks like it shouldn't be in a composting bin. It sh should be eaten. <laughs> and that is an element here as we look towards being more sustainable. It is just like you can't recycle your way out of problems. Before any food waste goes to composting, it should first be going to feed hungry people, right? If there's a, an outlet for it to be eaten, that's where it should go first. Uh, but we have a lot of problems. You can see we found one day an entire bin full of stale bread and every loaf of bread and bag of rolls was still in the plastic packaging. So we have instructed our hauler that if they see contamination, they're to leave it behind. And they let us know, we go over, we look at it, we correct the problem. So in this case, we got another container, we emptied every all that bread out of the little plastic bag so that it could still be composted. And then we we do outreach and education to dining, find out who's doing it. Frequently, it's just a new employee who just didn't know and they weren't educated. So uh, we like to know we don't want them to take it and throw it away. We want the opportunity to correct the problem, um, both to make it compostable by removing the contaminants when we can and do the proper outreach and education. The third, the third one. So the third one is another bin. It's kind of hard to see, uh, but it was over at the Marino Center. So we've got a lot of eateries in Marino, Be Good, Tate, Wallistons. Um, and I think we discovered that there, if you look closely, you'll see uh, bags of coffee, right? That package, this kind of foil packs that has coffee grounds in it. And they were all in the bin. There's food service gloves. There's actually masks in there. There's a lot of mixed in contamination. Um, but again, we, were, we knew that that coffee came from Wallistons. So we were able to go, show them the bin, talk to them about it, and they have since corrected the problem and we haven't seen, they, they we gave them some signage for their staff, they did more outreach and education and we have not had any more problems over there. So it takes a lot of effort and this is why when I mentioned to you and where they are just doing a large initiative all at once, um, you know, I think if we were to go in that direction, which I actually would like to go in that direction of composting in the dorms, we need to go in smaller steps so that we can manage the contamination and do outreach and education um, along the way. Um, so, in the, you know, at the beginning, I talked about sustainable waste management, and that's what we're trying to do here. And um, here I'm using the word zero waste because I do think we should be advancing our efforts towards zero waste. Um, again, I caution you with the word zero waste. What does that mean? Everyone defines it differently. Uh, frequently, it means no you know, recyclable or compostable waste to landfills, or it means diverting more than 90% of what you generate. Uh, but you have to be careful because we could divert a lot. You know, We could compost, recycle everything. But if it's contaminated, if people are what we call wish cycling, that I wish this would be recycled, so I'm going to throw it in the bin, and it's going to our recycling facility, well, it's still contamination, it's still trash. We're just moving that waste to somebody else. And so what we, we wanna to try to do is get it right at the beginning, right? And make sure that we're collecting what is recyclable and um, you know, moving that along appropriately. So in the big picture though, as we try to make improvements, there's some major topic areas that we really wanna focus on, which are across the top. And, then under each, there are actions we can take. And these are, in some cases, things we're doing or things we hope to do and are looking for a way to start. So I mentioned before, uh, reuse, reduction, you know, there's all these R's, recycle, right? But it's everything you can do before you get to recycling. So can you repurpose something? Can you refuse it in the first place? Don't take that bag, bring your own bag, you know, refuse it, re reuse it, repurpose it, um, reduce what you generate. So for here, um, what we need to do and are working to do is collaborate with our campus partners. Um, I've been talking to Trash to Treasure about possibilities of um, something like 
reusing office waste. And the business school this summer had a fabulous initiative where um, I don't know the circumstances. I think professors and staff were moving out in some relocations. And there was all this just loads and loads of really good items. There were books, there were office decorative supplies, there were brand new supplies, staplers, hole punches, file folders, all, all kinds of stuff. And they took the time, it was all organized, sorted, spread out. It was open for staff members, students to come in and see what they need. And a lot of that material went to reuse. It was, it was fantastic. And so we're hoping that through um, engagement with student groups, a group like Trash to Treasure might be able to do that on a larger scale and be able to find a way to move things that somebody really just doesn't need anymore or a professor leaves and there's all these good supplies to somebody who could use them, whether it's faculty, staff, or students. Um, and we have to review our procurement practices. We have to buy things the right way. We have to make sure that we're buying mattresses is, is an example. We recycle all our mattresses that come out of the dorms, but when we buy the mattresses, we need to make sure that we're buying something that has a long life and will last for a long time, and we're buying something that's recyclable. It's the, you know, closing the loop. Um, you buy something that's made of recyclable materials, you buy something that will last a long time, and you buy something that at the end of its life will be able to be recycled again. Um, we need to increase recycling, so we're trying to improve access, and that's the three-bin system, making sure recycling is there for everybody. And we're um, beginning to look at advancing some specialty programs. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do is um, recycle more batteries on campus, and um, alkaline batteries, your you know, AA, AAA, C, Cs, Ds, those actually can be thrown away. They're safe to throw away in the regular trash, but we recycle them whenever we can get them. So we're looking at the possibility of putting some battery recycling stations around campus in key locations. Uh, we've been for a couple of months now working with the labs to try to implement a lab plastic recycling program because that is a lot of it, but it can't be recycled with our regular materials. So we're doing a lot of that. Composting. Um, first, we're really trying to get the dining just stellar, that we're capturing all the food waste and we're eliminating all the contamination, and we are looking at implementing pilot programs. Uh, earlier this month, we started a pilot at Burlington, at one of the office buildings in Burlington, where we have the countertop containers in the kitchenette areas that um, staff use. So we're kind of testing that out. We'll see how it goes. I mentioned before, I'm very interested in doing a similar pilot in the dorms. And uh, we got to do some work to make that happen, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to move these along at a kind of a regular pace. Um, contamination. So we have been uh, doing audits of our waste stream and it's something we plan to do moving forward. Again, it's something we worked into our contracts with our vendors to allow us to do those audits and have them in do it, do it in partnership with us. Um, we did one of the two, you saw our paired compactors at Steps, and we did it at Curry, which also has the paired compactors trash next to the recycling. We brought them both to the recycling facility. They were uh, both full. They were dumped out on the floor. Uh, we actually brought a couple of students with us, uh, staff in the recycling facility staff were there. We were able to visually assess what was there. We, we observed a lot of recycling mixed in with the trash and vice versa, a lot of trash and recycling. Um, so we're hoping to do more of these audits and really get a sense of what is in our trash, where are our problem areas, and then target our outreach, our education, and our programs to correct the problems. Um, and lastly, we need to always evaluate where we're at. We need to keep growing and uh, staying up to date with what uh, like I talked about industry limitations, but there's also industry advancements. So when something advances, we want to be on top of that and able to expand our programs. Uh, to us, the data and the metrics are critical, um, that we collect as much data as we can, we analyze it, we know what it means. And uh, lastly, community engagement, which is what this is, you know, for, for, and I'll just go to the next slide, you know, students, uh, faculty, staff, everyone who is here on campus on a daily basis, we really need input and we want input from everybody to know, you know, how is it working for you? Should we be doing something different? Because 
we can look at data and conceptualize a program and put it in place, but if it doesn't work for the campus community, then we're not going to be successful. And so, you know, tonight, if in the Q&A time that we have, I would love to hear from all of you and then through the climate justice action planning process, um, we would love to hear your input about what you think we should be doing. You know, what are we missing in our programs? And what's important to you? Is, is better recycling the most important to you or do you prioritize composting? You know, what do you really think we need to do? What are the hurdles? So, and again, this gets to what Sheila said in terms of what stops you from doing um, what you might want to do. Is it not convenient? Is it unclear? Um, are you just too stressed because it's midterms or finals? You know, what, what are the hurdles and what can we do to redesign our approach to make it more successful? And then, you know, on a personal level, you know, what are you willing to do? What, you know, like that nudge, how can we nudge you? What, you know, how far are you willing to go? Um, and, we, and an example is if we talk about composting on a pilot basis in the dorms. Um, clearly, like a program like BU, where it's there for everybody, is, is great for convenience, but it's not so great if it's loaded with contamination. If we did a pilot and there was a bin, it was in, say, West Campus, and there was only one toad, and everybody had to walk to that toad, which might be out behind the building, would you still do it, or does it need to be right on your floor in order for you to do it? So we, you know, we want that input from all of you as to you know, how we can design a program that's effective and works for you. So um, with that, I think that was my last slide and it's just my contact information, but um, I will maybe put it back here and um, maybe Sheila can come back down if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to take your input, answer your questions. Correct. Yes, it is true. So um, we have made great efforts to not send our waste to landfill. And it's written, you know, into our contract um, with our vendor, which is JRM Recycling and Hauling, that uh, there can be exceptions, you know, because they don't own disposal facilities. They own the recycling facility where our recyclables go, uh, but their um, the trash goes to various transfer stations that are in Massachusetts in different locations, usually Lynn, Saugus, Danvers, sometimes Peabody. Many of those transfer stations are owned by the companies that own the waste energy facilities in Massachusetts, there are seven of them. And so, um, as you know, as far as I know, all of our waste is going there, but you never know when some, something unusual happens. It could be that a facility is closed for the day. There's a long line. There was something came up and on occasion, we may see our material have to go to a landfill, but it's infrequent. And um, I do, you know, I said it takes me a day to review and approve an invoice because we get a waste slip for every single load that goes out of here. And I look at every single one of them. I look at the times on it. I look at where it went. You know, I, I, so I understand where our waste is going. Um, so yes, to the, to the best of our knowledge and the best of our ability, we are um, not sending waste to the landfills. Yeah. Yes. I know that you mentioned that often the waste is not those right? By someone else, what procedures are currently in place to make sure that any of the is in fact going to send? So, um, for anyone who didn't hear, the question is um, what procedures are in place and what are we doing to make sure that we are uh, getting edible food to feed people before it's going to composting? Um, so, that question is more appropriate for um, Maureen Timmons, who was here at the last class. Um, I I think that there are some initiatives in place. I am not well versed on them. A while back, there was a, an app that you could have on your phone, which was a feed share app. Are you guys familiar with that? It's, is it still there? I mean, before COVID, that was a fantastic app and it worked, it primarily worked for events. So if somebody, if we were had, if we had food here tonight, right, and we had pizza and we had two pizzas left, we post it and generally, 
within 20 minutes, all that food was gone. So that was a wonderful app. It was very successful. So that, it's good to hear that that's still in place. Um, but that is a good question for, for Maureen and, and Jacob. We should talk about that during climate justice action planning and see if we can kind of, as a group, understand that more fully, because I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Anyone else? Anyone, does anyone think that uh, the nudge method works? Because I do have to say, I, uh, I was fascinated when you, when you were bringing that up in, um, you know, one from, and this is not Northeastern now, this is like my municipal hat from my role of a chair in the Waste Reduction Committee in my community. Uh, there's frequently discussion about on a municipal basis, moving to what we call a page to throw model, which is it's everything the opposite of what you said, right? It's putting a financial burden on people that you, if you have to throw away more, you're going to have to pay more. You have to pay for every bag you put out. And I've always believed that that was a great program and that's the way that we should move. And uh, I mean, it's not, you know, and it's that idea of um, as more people put the composting. So I also have in my community, um, you can sign up for curbside composting by subscription service. And it's true when you go through a neighborhood and you see all the green little bins out there, you start to think, oh, I'm glad I'm doing that. And why aren't those people doing that? So I don't know. Do you guys think that that nudge method is a a good way in the social, what do you call it, nudging and social pressure? Is that the right thing? Yes. Do you think that would work here? Maybe. We could try it. All right. Uh, anything online or are we? So how are we doing, Jacob? Are we, do you want to do anything for the last 15 minutes of the class? Well, I mean, I think it's good to people with the chat themselves about um, their experiences here in Northeastern and think of things that surprised you that we did well in recycling and things that you think we, we could do a lot better on. And, and, um, you've had any conversations with your fellow students or professors about, about waste. And just, you know, kind of, well, what's the topic of, of waste around Northeastern? Um, you know, because you have three groups here, so you just have like a five minute conversation and then you come back and just uh, continue in your connect. That's not good. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. One, two, three.
All right. Um, got a few minutes left. I'll wrap up your conversations, Ken. Thank you, thank you, Sheila, for joining the group. Um, do you guys want to go first in the back? What, what uh, insights or things that you guys discussed um, just now? For those online, the, the comment was about uh, um, the, how, how to help educate people and you know, limited resource in terms of um, um, trash receptacles and places in Boston. It's just kind of not on top of people's mind about, um, you know, oh, like, why, am I, why are we doing something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, anybody else, do you have any questions online or any comments online from the, from the group? You guys, uh, what you guys talk about? You can type away if you, if you don't mind, or you can join, uh, unmute yourself and talk if you'd like. But uh, what did you guys discuss just now? We talked a little bit about how we'd love to see composting on campus. Um, talked a little bit about how it's difficult, but pilot program would be great. Yeah. It's about building an awareness and education for how to compost correctly and contamination. Absolutely. The question is anybody compost at home? Um, it is, is it just in your backyard or do you have a program like a like a like municipal program where you put it on your front? I've composted before. So did you, do you guys do it like a, a your backyard compost, or do you just do it? Uh, do you have like a pickup, pickup, pickup? Pick up? Do the bin? Go to the backyard, yeah. yeah. Yes. In my apartment now, I think one of the people in the building has like tried one of the services. Yeah. Uh, so intermittently, I'll see if they try to have a couple of I was just thinking about where we were talking about ways that we could compost more, like make it more accessible without. Paying for a fairly costly sprinkler um, that might not take you full time because I, I don't personally generate that much. Today, yeah. So, yeah. So, both financially and logistically, not very, doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So, is it like reprehensible to slip our own food waste into the booster bucket? Or? Uh, you didn't hear anything from us. Okay. <laughs> so, my uh, Please. I. I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think the city of Boston has a program called Project Oscar. Have you heard of that? With drop off compost locations around the city. So that is one thing that you may want to check into. And I think in order to participate in Project Oscar, you have to just go online and register, just give me your address, give me a little kids that should you understand the elements of compost and what you can do. Um, that was my understanding. You may actually have access to a little drop off composting bin that somebody, somebody may want to get. Um, bringing off campus food waste on campus is really, you know, really shouldn't be bringing stuff on campus. Um, so, technically, no, we shouldn't be bringing stuff on campus here. Uh, but at the same time, you may come to campus with a little breakfast and lunch. and and that's again a pilot. You know, we should have piloted in the dorms, and we'd like to try to pilot a little drop off area 
and different offices that might compost, you know, a little container in your kitchen area would have a place to bring. You know, if we can't bring compost into the entire building. So hopefully we can make some of these changes over the next year. So they'll, I'll just go quick Google, quick Google search. Project Austria only in downtown in East Boston. But they're looking to expand. Oh, wait, no, they have, they have one in JP. So just Google them. That's so the question was where can we compost um, options in? Off campus without incurring the subscription costs. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. Go ahead. Online. Who, who, is, who is it? Philippe, Philippe, you, you can. I was just going to say that um that I, I had composted at my house and my, but I think the challenge with doing that was um like the so the so the food and the waste eventually turned in soil, but there was a lot of like pests that like were like in the composting, like there were like roaches and stuff like that, like. I mean, I guess it's just like a part of nature and stuff oh, like that. Sorry, Nobody... I lost Phil. It was my fault. I tried to turn the volume up. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, um, like, there were a lot of pests that came from doing sorry, the compost. Um, I, 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 I messed with the, I messed with the, <laughs> the uh, oh, volume okay. and then we lost it, sir. Um, you guys have anything you want to share? Um, we talked about all kinds of stuff. We talked about the music in our piece, to raise awareness, we talked about altruism and our past experience with it, as well as briefly talking about this nudge effort and how silent norm can change over time. All right, any final thoughts or questions before we, before we get going? Um, there is, uh, Sue is doing a tour of facilities this Friday at 10, and you're meeting at Curry, right? On, on the Snell Library side, right? Yeah, right outside the doors. Right outside the doors. Uh, so look forward to seeing some of you there. Um, no, not on the Snell Library side, the opposite side. Oh, Robinson, Robinson Floyd, Robinson. where they're doing all the construction. Right, because that's where you have, you have all the bins over there. Right. So we're going to, sorry. So the tour on Friday with Sue at 10 is meeting on the Robinson Quad side of Kirk. Um, any questions, just email me or Sophie, and we'll, we'll help you out with that. Uh, next week's our last class. Uh, we have Steve Schneider from uh, the, the Director of Landscaping and uh, Kate Kinnon over in the Architecture School. Uh, they're going to talk a lot about the uh, ecology of the, uh, the urban campus here. And uh, we have our, our final assignment, the, the white paper. Um, if you have any questions on that, please let us know. But the idea is to kind of take what you've learned here maybe some other ideas and think about what it would be like to uh, do something more here on campus, i.e. composting is, is an example. Kind of trying to uh, understand the problem, find out ways to, you know, uh, ways to, well, we can implement it and, uh, uh, you know, get a, be get a better outcome, but also start thinking about how to overcome and acknowledging some of the limitations um, that, um, university would have, to, would have to do as part of that program. So again, any questions, just I'll let us, Sophie and I know, and we'll try to help you out. That. So thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for your questions. And um, we'll see you next week. And also don't forget about the community conversation on climate justice. It's uh, next Wednesday, um, 10 to seven, uh, over at Curry Student Center, where we we're encouraging everyone in the Northeastern campus to come and share their ideas and what they envision Northeastern doing on compost, on energy, on, on a whole variety of things dealing with resilience and climate change. Thanks, everybody.